the most recognisable map on the planet. And why? Because you're all familiar with it, it's the London Underground map. It's 155 years old. And those little lines, those colourful lines and those little circles on that map has been in existence for that time. And I'm thinking about all those people that I've ever visited London have used this map. So I think it's probably the most recognisable. And there's a new line on there that you'd probably be able to see. It's a double pink line. It starts off at Heathrow Airport. And then it goes up, and then it takes a right, and it goes all the way over into East London. And that's called Crossrail. And Crossrail has been named now the Elizabeth Line. In about three years' time, it'll be open. And I've spent 12 years of my life designing and building one of the stations on Crossrail which is Tottenham Court Road Station. I'm going to be talking to you about the design of that station. And this is Crossrail. So this is a map of London. There's little colourful little blobs there. They are the bits where the action happens in London. So we probably live where they're in Zone 3. Um, people live on the outskirts. And then they come into work. And the green is the Canary Wharf. That's where the business end happens, the city. And then the orange is the city of London. And then the purple is the West End. And that's where people work rest and play. And then you've got this big machine, Heathrow Airport, which is going to get another runway. And that line is bringing people together. So th there's this notion of home working at the moment, utter myth. As a species, what we crave is each other. If you look at any coffee house anywhere in London, it is full of young people with computers, sipping away, engaging. That is how we are built. And what Crossrail does, what the infrastructure does of a city, is bring those people together. Because when you bring people together, you share ideas. You can't really do that from home. That's my personal opinion. Um, and this was a sketch. This is a sketch that our client gave us um, seven and a half years ago. And I remember that because my son was born the day we got the commission. And he's seven and a half years old. And that's how long it's taken just to design and get to where we are building one of these mega projects. Now... This is a scheme that we're building in London, and London is probably better at building infrastructure than any other city on the planet. Why? Because it's the most tunnel city on the planet. It's because we're very good at it. It's because we've been doing it for 150 years, so we sort of know our onions. But Crossroad here is slightly different because it's larger than the London underground that you know. It's so big that actually every station has to have two entrances. Um, the London underground station typically has one. Um, they are so wide apart that the client felt that actually they're emerging in different parts of the city. And the thing about London, unlike other cities, is that it's very historic and it is a patchwork. It is a patchwork of villages. And so the client said to us is that I want you to design the station entrances to reflect the context that they're in, to reflect the village and the community and the people that, that are surrounding it. But the actual platforms themselves, which are huge, will have an identity of their own. So you'd recognize we're on the Crossrail line. And that is an image of Tottenham Court Road Station. Some of you might recognize there's Oxford Street on there, there's a center point, the iconic landmark structure, which is right at the bottom of Tottenham Court Road and, and Oxford Street. So currently at the moment, there is this huge machine, and that's the way I see it, it's a machine, being built underneath the streets of Soho and St. Giles. And that has taken circa about 10 years to actually construct. Now I call it a machine because if you look at the processing power of that machine, um, every day, 4.4 million Londoners get on the tube. Strangely, that amount of people get on the buses as well. What Crossroad will do as London fills up, will take 10% of all those people. So currently at the moment, the population of London is 8.4 million. It is as big as it has ever been. It is only going one way. It will be 10 million in about nine years' time. That means Birmingham moving to London in the next 10 years, whether we like it or not. So infrastructure plays a key part. So this building of infrastructure, especially when it's so old, is absolutely key. And just so that you have it in context, for all of you, any of you that visited Tottenham Court Road Station about seven years ago, that small little ticket hole underneath center point, that is that small little funny shape just underneath center point. That is the old London Underground Station. And the red line, moving left to right, North, that's the central northern line. The rest of the picture is what we're building for Crossrail. So currently at the moment, 
That small little ticket hall used to take 100,000 people. This is anticipated in 2019, 200,000 people will use that station, probably more. Probably more. Um, and just to put that into perspective, Terminal 6, or the third runway that will be built for Heathrow, well, every day, 200,000 people use Heathrow. 200,000 people will be using this station. And we have seven of these stations in the central section. And this is a picture of the site about say, seven or eight years ago. That is at the bottom of Oxford Street. That is at the, one of the busiest junctions in the whole of London. And behind some of those struts, 100,000 people were using it to go to work and play every single day. So this is like performing open heart surgery. And that's what we are currently doing across the whole network. And if that doesn't work, the city dies. So we are very, very reliant on building these machines. But the context that we were working was Soho. Soho, historic. I mean, it is, for us, it was a place where people come to play. It has a nocturnal, almost illicit environment. And what we wanted to do was design a station that reflected that. And so our station there was actually dark. It was black. We actually make it out of black stone. But what we did was that Soho has an abundance of beautiful Georgian buildings. And we had to demolish two Georgian blocks. We had to, to build this station. Why? Because actually the station goes six stories down underneath the ground. So we had to take them away. And so the borough, the council, said to us, what we want is two buildings. The building, the station building, would be a modern building. But the building to the rear will be uh, your modern take on the Georgian townhouses that you demolished. And so we did. So we had to demolish an old pub. And what we did was that we took some of the manifestation that was there from that Victorian pub. And then we took that and we actually perforated some of the metal panels that we're using to clad. And they allow for the building to actually breathe. So the memory of the building that was there is now then taken into this structure. Now remember, these structures here that we're designing are for 120 years. And these are the two new buildings. In the middle is a street called Holland Street. That used to be a street that was there for about, say, 170 years, and we actually moved it seven meters. We had to, to make the station fit. So you have a contemporary building, which is the station building on the left, which is the black building, which is visible. So you can actually see inside. You can see that it's a station. So from those tiny little Georgian streets that exist around Soho, you will see artwork. You will see people moving into the station. The building on the right is a simple residential building. On the ground floor, we have retail. We're putting back the shops that once used to be there. But it's made out of brick, beautiful brick. And these are the two blocks. We're pedestrianizing Dean Street. Dean Street used to be a road that people used to drive down. But now, actually, it's going to be pedestrianized. Why? Because the amount of people that are coming out of these stations is so much that you, they need a space to meet, to dwell. We see people meeting there at, say, 11 o'clock at night, coming in from East London to go out all morning and jumping on the first train back at six in the morning. They need a place to meet and play. So you need those places within an our city. But strangely, the way we're building this, there is not one bricklayer on site building any of those bricks. Because this entire building is being built in the Midlands. It's being built in a factory in the Midlands and being driven down the M6. So we are using modern methods of construction because it makes it safer and quicker. And it's very, very difficult to build things on site with lots of people when you're creating open heart surgery. And we are building that across site. And that is how we are, will be building our Crossrail 2s. All our new infrastructure will be built as a kit of parts, like a machine. And the interior station, this is down. This is when you come off the station. From the train, from the glimpse of your eye, you'll see a little black interior of the station. That will be the Soho end. We've created some lighting there, which almost like mimics the theater lighting, a bit like in this room. So it feels as though you're about to go out for a night out. The platforms, though, they have a completely different identity. Now, these platforms are different from the London Underground ones. They're 260 meters long. A London Underground platform is 100. So Londoners do not understand or appreciate what they are about to jump on in the next three years. It is phenomenal. It's a completely different proposal. And actually, we're building it on time, on program. It's very successful. Why? Because we've been doing it for 150-odd years. But this is St. Giles. This is the other end. This is under the centre point. 
Our ticket hall in there, we increased seven times the size to accommodate all the people. We've got these two new glass entrances. And we've got new public realm. The public realm here is key. You've got 130,000 people coming out of this very station. And the reason is, is that we wanted this to be a really important station within West, the West End. Because from here, rather than jumping on the tube at Covent Garden or putting strain on the other networks, you get out and you walk across beautiful streets and you go to Covent Garden. You go out to the bars. So you walk. Walking is good for you. But I wanted to talk about art as well, and it's something that we do in our practice. Um, we tend to work a lot with fine artists, and some of you might recognize this. These are the Eduardo Paolozzi tiles. Um, now, these have been there since in the 1980s, and what Paolozzi did, who was a pop artist, he looked at the culture of the space above. He looked at the streets. He looked at the activity. He looked at what people were doing in the streets of Soho. And what he did is that he replayed that on the streets in the subterranean. So he looked at the British Museum. There's mosaics there. He looked at... TVs, you used to be able to get TVs in Tottenham Court Road. So we actually dedicated one artwork just to buying TVs. But you can't get them anymore simply because of the way we shop. Tim Panali, etc. And he talked about the urban chaos on the streets. So what we've done is that we've lovingly cleaned up and restored all the mosaics. And where we've had to take them away because we've built the new ticket hall, we've actually sent them to a school of art in Edinburgh where they are now making those arches to be put in a gallery. But Art on the Underground, Art on the Underground is the London Underground initiative that puts art in all our stations. They commissioned another artist, uh, Mark Wallinger, who won the Turner Prize. Now, Mark Wallinger created this piece here, which is called Labyrinth 138 Tottenham Court Road. And it's a labyrinth because, just like a tube station, a labyrinth, unlike a maze, it's one way in and one way out. A maze you get lost in. These machines that London Underground create, do they, they do not want you to get lost in them. They want you to be in and out as quickly as possible onto the streets of London town. And it's a circle. Why? Because every one is a circle. He made 270. 270 because there's 270 stations on the line. They're a circle because it's um, a roundel, the roundel that we all love, the tube. And each one is different. So he went to the station, and he felt what that subterranean environment was like, and then he created a piece of artwork that reflected that. And it's number 138 because there are a few people that choose to jump on the very first train when it opens and try and visit every single station on the line in one day. And the only way you can do that is by having a certain sequence. And 138 means that you have to be at Tottenham Court Road. That is 138 stations. So each one is labeled, not as an addition, but as the moment that you need to be at that station to complete it in one day. And you can't do it at weekends with a night tube. So look out for yours in your station. But I've spent the past seven years working with um, a French artist, the French minimalist, Daniel Buren. Um, and Daniel Buren um, works in situ. What he does is that he doesn't do an artwork, put it in a gallery and then take it away. He creates permanent pieces, a bit like an architect does. And he's created currently one of the largest in situ artworks ever to commission by London Underground, which is slowly being revealed as the station incrementally opens. And his trademark is a stripe, and it's an 87 mil stripe that he uses. And he has been using it for 50 years. And when I asked him, I said, why do you use that stripe? Why is it 87 mil, 8.7 centimeters? He said, well, when I was a student, I had various canvas strips, and I stitched them together. And 87 mil was the most scalable in terms of beauty from one to a million. And now he's painted it, only he can use that stripe. And for him, it's a unit. It's a, bit, it's a unit that, when he applies it to a material, it helps you um, understand that space through that unit. And it's a bit, in a way, like the tiles that we'd see on an underground. It modularizes, it makes the space familiar. But he said to me, he goes, the thing about you, London, is that you're always looking quite stressed. I, 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 I'm going to add color, because I want this piece to be filled with joy. And so there's five colors there, forms, circles, and lozenges that sort of cascade through the station. And our structure just cuts it. But what he did was that there's two main entrances, and he wanted to characterize the two entrances. So there was legibility in terms of wayfinding. So to go to Govan Garden, you've got the colorful ones. But to go to Oxford Street, you use the black and the white. And they did this 100 years ago because the trades previously in London, they were illiterate but they would look at the colors of the tiles on the platforms, and that's where they would meet their pals. A bit like the pubs that you get, the fox on the hound, you have the picture. They couldn't read the text. 
And that's what we're doing here because it is one of the most diverse stations along the line. And this is, this is a view that you'll see. This is the top end of Oxford Street. And this is what you'll see. So this is art generally in the public domain. Day and night, 24-7, you will see this image. And this is by one of the most famous French artists. Um, and I wanted to ask that question, what is art for? Why do we make art? And Brian Eno, who's a musician and an artist and a philosopher, he did a John Peel lecture, and I think he sort of nailed it. He said, art is everything that you don't need to do, that we don't need to do. And what he meant by that was that as a species, as, as homo sapiens, what we do is that once we filled our belly and we found a cave and we found shelter, every homo sapien on the planet then takes something that is functional and they stylize it. And that is why we need art and architecture, because actually we are very, very good at building a machine. But actually, as a species, as a people, we want more than a machine. Because when you, when you make more than a machine, it tells you something about yourself. Thank you. Thank you.